Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Have you ever looked around Hawaii? Are we getting better or are we getting worse? How about the entire world? As we look at problems that face us today, sometimes we can become overwhelmed. Global warming, the rise of population, GMOs. We hear about these things all the time and a lot of people say it must be getting to be worse and worse to live in this planet. Some people have even decided they're not going to bring children into the planet because they're a drain on resources and the quality of life of everyone. Well, as you know, at the Grassroot Institute, we like to base our beliefs upon data. We like to look at the actual research that is done into every field. And today I'm delighted that I have somebody who actually researches the quality of life. He's an economist at the Brigham Young University of Hawaii. And in that role, he studies actual data that tells us how we're doing as people here on the planet and in the country and in Hawaii. My guest today is Gail Pooley, who is in the Department of Business and teaches economics at Brigham Young University. Please welcome him to the program. Welcome, Dr. Pooley. Thank you. Gail, I'm so glad you can be here. Great to be here. Now, you're not a long-term Hawaii resident. You've decided to move here to Paradise. And how long have you been here and where'd you come from? Uh, we came from Idaho and I've been here for about a year and a half. Tell me a little bit about your academic background. You know, I have a PhD and um, did uh, undergrad in economics and uh, did graduate work as well in that area. Um, and what do you do up there at BYU? I teach economics. All right. Well, let me not go any further than that and just ask you a basic, basic question. I studied a textbook by a man named Paul Samuelson when I was a student at Northwestern University. That's where I learned my economics. The, study of the allocation of scarce resources, but you would teach people today. Tell us what is economics in the simplest way we could possibly understand. You know, Samuelson had a great book and uh, it was the number one selling book for three or four decades. Uh, his definition that he used is how do we allocate resources when we live in this world of scarcity? That is a, that's a very good foundation definition of economics. Uh, today, however, we would probably expand that to uh, how do people cooperate with each other to create value for one another. Now, that's a completely different question, because if you're looking at scarce resources from the beginning as the very basis for the study of economics, there's a presumption there that resources are scarce and becoming scarcer, and it's almost a zero-sum game when you talk about the distribution of resources. But tell me more about your definition. It has more to do with creating value. Yes. How does that get us beyond the resource limitation question? You know, we've always lived in a world of scarcity. I mean, we never have enough time. We never have enough. The question is, how do we measure that? And uh, the opposite of scarcity is really abundance. And what is abundance? And so our uh, thinking uh, currently is, is, is there a definition of abundance that we can use to begin to measure changes in this relative scarcity. Now, before you give me that definition, let me just point out the shift I'm hearing you talk about. Shifting from thinking of, of competing for scarce resources to the mode of creating abundance. Absolutely. So what is abundance? You know, abundance is, is really this, the definition that, that we use uh, is it's the measurement of prices relative to population. Say that again. Prices relative, relative to, to population. To population. E explain that. Well, a, a traditional measurement might be uh, we want to know how much oil we have. All so right. let's go out and try to count up how many barrels sure. we've got. And we have a quantity. Uh, quantity is interesting, but it really doesn't help us make the deeper decisions we need to about the scarcity of that oil. And so we, we shift from quantity to prices. Prices, we believe, contain a lot more information than just a quantity number, because prices are basically uh, information that buyers and sellers, market participants, are telling us about the relative scarcity of that particular item. So, for example, in ancient Greece, it would cost you a fortune to have running plumbing in your house to be able to flush a toilet 
without going outdoors to a community facility. But today, it's relatively cheap. No one needs to have a lot of money to have that. Or back in the day when only the very wealthy could afford an, an iPad, today virtually anyone can afford a small little device that replicates what an iPad does. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So w when we think about this, it's, it's are we being able to create things for one another that allow us to uh, escape poverty? Are we lifting ourselves out of poverty? And this process of creating new things, innovation, is, is really what we think about today. Uh, for example, when you, when you think about a physical resource, think about a piano. A piano has 88 keys. Uh, but how many songs can you create with those 88 keys? I would imagine an infinite number of it's songs. It's an infinite number. So we live in this world where we have a physical limitation on the number of atoms that are on the planet. But we really have infinite ways that we can rearrange those atoms. Now that's very encouraging because you're moving economics away, as we said earlier, from looking at scarce resources, which pits us against each other to compete for those scarce resources. You're moving economics into a realm in which we cooperate to take resources and bring out an infinite amount of abundance. Exactly. My goodness, exactly. this so, is good stuff. Here's another thing. We, we look at an iPhone and we say, you know, it's about four or five ounces of atoms. Uh, you know, you got four or five ounces of water. Um, but these atoms have always, always been on the planet. We've just been able to come up with new ways to rearrange these atoms in ways that create value for one another. In short, technology and innovation today are enabling us to take what we considered limited resources and unlock the infinite potential of these resources for a massive amount of abundance. Is that what you're saying? It's even deeper than that. It's not just the technology, it's the conditions that you have to look at that allow people to have the freedom to pursue these ideas that technology comes out of that. I'm glad you said that because we're talking then about the rise of democracy and the spread of economic freedom across the world because without those, the technology would only be in the hands of a few. Exactly. Well, this has been a great introduction, and uh, so that our, our viewers uh, don't uh, doze off on us because I've put, pushed us into a theoretical realm, I want to ask you some practical questions that people are asking all the time. You know, is the world getting better or is it getting worse? People look at the rise of population, for example, and uh, later on I'll ask you a bit about your paper, but before we get technical, when people look at the rise of population and they think with the framework we have scarce and limited resources, it can be pretty scary. And, and you hear a lot of doomsday uh, spoken of today. What is your thought about this? You know, it's interesting, a recent movie, uh, the Avengers Infinity Wars movie, there was the, the antagonist in that movie. And we're giving, we're giving them a royalty for that. <laughs> yeah, the antagonist in that movie was a guy by the name of Thanos. And he said, the universe is finite, its resources finite, if life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correcting. So that movie was all That's about the gospel this, of scarcity. Yeah, the same idea that, look, we live on this, this uh, limited planet and we're growing people. We're going to run out of space and resources. And you know what Thanos said is often cited as the condition for warfare. And some have even defined war as being the result of scarce resources and competition for those scarce resources. So. You're talking about something very different. You're challenging a mentality that has been with us for quite a while. Yeah, the zero-sum game that we have a limited number of resources that we have to divide up into us. Uh, you know, we have a limited size of a pie that we have to divide up, divide up with smaller and smaller slices as we, as we have more and more people on the planet. That, that theory is, is not uh, valid. Well, let's go to the presumption that the world is getting worse and worse and resources are becoming more and more scarce. What does the data actually show? Well, uh, the data actually show, and the study that we looked at is, look, let's just look at commodities, basic commodities, rice, wheat, oil, um, bananas, uh, copper, iron ore. What have those uh, commodities done over the past 30 or 40 years in terms of the price? And so we initially looked at the price, went back to 1980, uh, looked at the price of those items and compared the price today. So in a nominal sense, the price tag, the price had gone up. We look around, it looks like prices are going up. Uh, when you adjust for those prices and you remove the inflation, 
uh, those prices on the average have gone down. In, in other words, you're saying it is actually cheaper to acquire those commodities today for the individual than it was years ago. On the average, if you purchased one of those items in 1980, mm -hmm. for the time it took you to earn the money to purchase that item in 1980, you could have 2.8 of those items today, almost three, three of those items today. So that's the pathway of abundance. That is the pathway of abundance. Now, how pervasive is that finding? In other words, are, did you just use some examples uh, there that will make your case? Or well, is there actually a, a pattern that we can see in, in terms of the ability to own, possess, acquire, all kinds of things? So what we did is we went to the World Bank, and the World Bank actually reports on commodity prices each month. Mm -hmm. And we used their data, and uh, that's how we formed the foundation of the study. And uh, the additional thing that we did is we, we also took the, the price and divided it by uh, average hourly income. For example, uh, the way that we calculate this abundance is we look not only at the price of something, but how much income it required to purchase that item. Because what we also observed is as you see innovation happen, it, it not only lowers prices, but it increases income. So. For example, pizzas, let's say they're $10 a day, and your, your hourly earning is $10 an hour. So it would take you one hour to buy that pizza today. Well, there's two ways the pizza can get cheaper. The price can go down, right. or your income can go up. And then you can afford more pizza. Right. Well, why don't you and I take a pizza break now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and in about 120 seconds, we're going to be back. Dr. Pooley has some fascinating things to share, and I'm going to corner him and ask him to demonstrate that the world is actually getting better for the majority of people. So you don't want to go away. You won't want to miss that. I'm Kili'i Aquino with the Grassroot Institute. We'll be right back after this short break on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Don't go away. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Hey, aloha, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. I'm Andrew Lang, the host of Security Matters Hawaii. I'm airing here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, and I'm trying to bring this community information, security information specifically, that will help you live a safer life, help keep our communities safer, and help keep our, our businesses safer. Um, so join me, because security matters. Aloha. Welcome back to Hawaii Together with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Kili'i Akina at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Well, I'm going to ask our professor today to tell us whether the world is getting better or getting worse for the majority of people. And uh, with that question, I think we're going to dispel a lot of things people think because we often go by our intuition, our feelings, or what the media says, or just peer pressure when we say, look around, we're running out of things. The environment is depleted. How are we going to survive? Well, let's take a look at what the data says. Please welcome back Dr. Gail Pooley of BYU Hawaii. Well, Gail, it's a big question, and a lot of people are, are saying that we're headed toward a cataclysmic doomsday. You know, I remember back in my own high school days, way back in the 1870s, <laughs> we had a guy named Thomas Malthus we studied, who was considered the prophet of doom, and then a guy named Paul Ehrlich, who wrote a book called The Population Bomb, which convinced virtually everybody except a few people on the planet that we were headed for a, a catastrophe, that the world is getting so big that the people can't be supported by its resources, and that the only thing that will help us is if we kill each other off and then start all over again. What is your theory? Are we getting better or are we getting worse? You know, I think I went to the same high school you did. Because <laughs> <laughs> I read the same thing and, and went to the same conclusion. And it wasn't until the 80s uh, where I began to really dig into the data and begin to read a few uh, economies, uh, economics uh, uh, books where I, I really uh, began to question that. And as I dug deeper, the data suggested the actual, actually the opposite was occurring, that things were getting cheaper, they were getting more expensive. Now, if we really do live on a planet 
that's limited in size and we increase population, we should see two things happening. We should see prices go up and we should see life expectancy go down. And those two things, the opposite happen. We're seeing prices go down and life expectancy go up. Right. What about right. the quality of life of those people who are living longer? Well, uh, that, that is a good question. I think the first quality of life is quantity of life. If you have more life, you're, by definition, your quality of life has got to be increasing. So you're saying the world is actually getting better. Can you give me a, another couple of examples? Uh, you know, I think when we, we first of all, we look at, at prices of things. Uh, what commodity uh, has gotten more scarce in the last 30 years? What fundamental foundation commodity that's necessary for life, energy, food, uh, minerals, has actually become more scarce or has gotten more expensive? Our analysis of World Bank data uh, indicates not one, not one of the 50 that we looked at. So that would suggest that people on the bottom uh, are actually benefiting the most when these foundation uh, commodities become more abundant. Now today we're very readily exposed to the narratives of famine, drought, population growth within small regions and warfare, other things that are very destructive of human humanity itself. Is that because they're increasing, as some say, which you would not? Or is that because perhaps today's technology available on the media, instant coverage of these items, makes them readily apparent to us? And so they get a disproportionate level of attention. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I think we've, we've always lived in this world where there's risk. Today, however, because of our ability to innovate, because we've, we've been able to escape poverty, we can anticipate these uh, events, we can prepare for them. I think about the volcano that occurred here, you know, not too long ago. I mean, uh, we anticipated it, uh, the hurricane that was uh, coming our way here, we were able to prepare for it, plan for it, and as a consequence, our, our risk uh, of having problems with that event, much, much lower than they've ever been in history. Well, I'll tell you about the volcanic eruptions on the Big Island of Hawaii. I'm not aware of, I could be mistaken, but I'm not aware of any death that occurred as a result of that. And uh, I hope my viewers will correct me if I'm wrong. And yet scenes of the volcano deluging homes and so forth were played over and over across national and global media. Whenever I traveled during the eruptions, people would ask me about it and, and would be under the impression that we were just inundated with this disaster all throughout mm -hmm. the Hawaiian Islands and people were suffering and dying, which really, uh, and uh, I don't want to be insensitive to those who did lose their homes and did suffer much. But for the most part, w we escaped through the level of technology we have, the deaths of anyone. You know, there's a great book that was just published called Factfulness by Hans Rosling. And Bill Gates actually uh, highly recommended it last year. He gave a copy to every graduating uh, college student. And Hans uh, makes the case that the media... We, we have to remember that they're in the profit-making business, and the way to make profit is to capture people's attention and hold their attention. And these stories that are really exceptional stories are what do that. Um, and what we've noted is the ability to be able to scan the globe and find these little exceptional things has gotten really easy to do. So consequently, uh, if you watch any of these networks, you, you're just a continual crisis of uh, something after something, but they're really, really exceptional and rare. And that's why, that's why they make the news, is they're so exceptional. Now, you've written a paper based upon the work of Julian Simon. and It's called, it refers to the Simon Abundance Principle or Index. Tell us about that and, and tell us what superabundance means. Yeah, we, we actually said, uh, is there this relationship between population and resources? What is that relationship? Using the World Bank data, uh, we were able to uh, determine that as population went from about 4.5 billion people in 1980 to over 7.5 billion today, we added 3 billion people to the planet. What happened to these resource prices? Uh, and our finding, uh, based on uh, this World Bank data, is that the time price, the time it takes a person to earn the money to buy one of these items, had uh, fallen by about 65%. So population increases by almost 70%, prices fell by 65%. So 
clear relationship between the two. And the theory that we really use to explain that is that human beings are idea creators. And if they're free to create these ideas and act on them, they make everybody around them wealthy. In other words, when I come up with a new idea, I benefit from it, but, but I, everybody around me also benefits from it. And so if we can create this environment where people have this ability to be creative, uh, be inventive, and have markets that they can go test their ideas out with, and they have a culture that allows this to happen, then we see this tremendous flourishing of, of human uh, ingenuity. Think about China. Um, in 1990, 70% uh, of the Chinese population lived on $2 a day. Today, it's less than 2%. How did that happen? You know, it happened because the Chinese uh, culture allowed their entrepreneurs who were there all the time to bloom. Really, it was this great awakening of Chinese entrepreneurship that has lifted China from, from where they were to where they are today. And there's, there's really no reason to not believe that that can't happen in India, it can't happen in Africa. If we can take these fundamental principles that recognize human creativity uh, and, and allow those things to, to be part of these uh, different countries. I want to go back to something you said earlier, particularly because you're talking about China. You mentioned that it, was far, it is far more than technology or innovation or even human creativity that is responsible for the growing abundance. It's also the conditions under which these processes can thrive, conditions that uh, uh, really are defined by the political environment. I think you're talking about freedom, you're talking about liberty. Do you want to tell me a little more about that? Yeah, uh, you know, if we, if we dig deep into this innovation process, the foundation is human beings and freedom. And a little bit of freedom actually can go a long ways. And when you talk about a little bit, I think of China. China did not change its political structure in the past 30 or 40 years but it's allowed pockets of entrepreneurship and innovation to flow through its system. And so when you say a little bit of innovation, a little bit of freedom right. can make a difference, I, I do think of places like China that have introduced a little bit of freedom. But w what happens when people are allowed to have an abundance of freedom, an abundance of liberty, the uh, right to self-determinism? Then you see Hong Kong, you see Singapore, you see South Korea. I mean. We can look at North Korea and South Korea, fly over that peninsula at night, and the light will tell you how much freedom is there. So we're talking about economic prosperity, abundance, and, and the opportunity for human flourishing. Yes. Yes, indeed. So you've come up with a term, or you use a term, maybe Simon came up with it, of superabundance. We're going to close off our program now, but talk a little bit about doing economics with the framework of superabundance. So when we begin to analyze abundance, we actually came up with four different abundance zones. Uh, decreasing abundance, which is scarcity. Uh, emerging abundance, where uh, population is increasing, but prices are not increasing at the same rate. And then we have a zone called um, emer uh, increasing abundance, where uh, we, we note that prices actually begin to fall as population goes up. And then superabundance is where prices are actually falling faster proportionally to population. For example, let's say we have Thanksgiving here uh, and you invite over 10 of your friends and the cost per uh, person is $10 to buy the, the food sure. for Thanksgiving dinner. So your total grocery bill is going to be $100, right? 10 people at $10. Right. Now, if the number of people you invited increased by 70%, and the prices had fallen by 70%, what would your grocery bill be? Would it be more or less? It'd actually be significantly less. And so you'd have experienced superabundance. We're going to have to close off the yeah. program, but uh, you... i got to come back. You have to come back, <laughs> and you make me think about some people who say this world is becoming so uh, bad and lacking in resources it would be a crime to bring children into this world because they wouldn't have an abundance. Yeah. How about you, Dr. Pooley? How many children do you have? I have seven. Seven. Well, yeah. there you go. <laughs> seven, and we're you, trying to increase the value. abundance on the planet. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. I'm glad you've, you're making the world more abundant. I'm glad to be partnering with All you. All right. Thank you for being with us today. Very good. Thank you. My guest is Gail Pooley.
who is a professor at H P uh, at uh, Hawaii BYU campus uh, up uh, on the north part of the Oahu where we live, and uh, it has just been fascinating. You know, I'm just looking for searching for words to describe my elation at the fact that we can switch from a model of thinking about scarcity and limited competition for that scarcity to a model of creating an abundance of everything in this world for the quality of life for all people based upon freedom. And that's what it's all about. I'm Kili'i Akina on ThinkTech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. We'll be with you next week again. Aloha.